Part 1. For that one day, born under a good star. It is said that the reason for a state to nurture its soldiers for years is to use them for just one day. My entire youth was dedicated to that one day. I was born on December 3, 1902, in a farm village called Iwaki, in Kita Katsuragi province of Nara Prefecture. It was a beautiful place located at the foot of Mount Nijio. When I was born, my father was the principal of Iwaki Village Elementary School, and my family lived in a farmhouse near the school. It was a six-mat room, approximately 90 square feet, on the second floor of a go-down. I was born there with the assistance of a midwife. The stairs were narrow and steep, and it was not easy to bring up hot water. So the midwife took the newly born baby downstairs, which had been used as a cowshed, to give me my first bath. Later in life, when I became a Christian and learned that Jesus himself was born in a stable and gave his first cry in a basin, I was emotionally touched by the resemblance, even with the difference between a cowshed and a stable. Now, I believe that the objective of my life as a Christian is to follow Jesus Christ. My father's name was Yazo. He was born in Masuja, a village of no more than 20 households, located in Takaichi province of Nara Prefecture. From his childhood he learned Chinese classics in a cram school nearby, and he was good at calligraphy. When he was around 20 years old, his great ambition was to study in Tokyo, but he was penniless. Carrying only an ink brush, he travelled alone all the way along the 53 stages of the Tokaido, the historic trail from Kyoto up to Tokyo, earning his travel expenses by writing Chinese poems on sliding doors on the way. I am an unworthy son of such a samurai. My father was proud of the fact that he was born on the second day of January of the fourth year of the Keio era, 1868. Based on the outcome of the Civil War, the Keio era was renamed Meiji. If he had been born a day earlier, his birth date would have been the first day of Meiji, when the course of Japan's history changed. This would have been a cause of great celebration for my father. Looking at history, Hideyoshi Toyotomi, Japan's great warrior unifier, was born on the first day of January of the fifth year of Tenman, 1536, the son of a peasant warrior, Yeman, in what is now Nakamura-ku, Nagoya. Legend has it that when his mother became pregnant with Hideyoshi, she had a dream that the son had entered her womb. When she gave birth, the infant was named Hiyoshi Maru, lucky child of the sun, but this was later changed to Hideyoshi. My father often told me, after having a bit to drink in the evening, that if he had been born one day earlier, he could have become a regent like Hiyoshimaru. But because of just one day, he ended up as nothing more than the principal of an elementary school. It sounded like both a lament and a boast at the same time, and I used to wonder if it was so meaningful to be born under a good star. The Russo-Japan War broke out when I was three. Under Japanese custom at the time, a person was considered to be born on the day he was conceived. Hence, at birth, a child was one year old. The war started in 1904 and ended the following year. Even as an infant, what I remember is that everyone kept saying, a small country in the Far East has managed to defeat a giant country like Russia. In a militaristic atmosphere, soldiers appear pompous and great, the three-year-old boy, with his impressionable spirit, yearned to be a soldier, and he suddenly wanted to be a full admiral when he grew up, like the great Admiral Heihachiro Togo, who defeated the Russian navy at the Battle of the Sea of Japan. It was something that this three-year-old boy more than admired. He was obsessed with the idea. He played only at being a soldier, and whenever he saw soldiers, he used to follow them endlessly. One day, I lost my way back in the darkness, and a policeman from a different village had to take me back to my home. When I entered school, I was absorbed with picture books about the war. Day after day, one after another, I would look at tens of books, without getting tired or bored. I dreamt of commanding an army like General Michitsura Nozu and General Tamemoto Kuroki. One day, my uncle, who was my mother's younger brother, came from Osaka to see us. As usual, I was painting a war picture with my crayons. Uncle told my mother that, He paints so well, why don't you encourage him to become a painter? My mother's response was, Anything but a painter. I don't want him to be like Ju Yan. I want him to become a doctor. 
Ju Yan, or Jutaro Kuroda, was a relative who was an art student, and he visited us once in a while and would sketch the sights around our village. For my well-bred mother, the life of a painter typically was moneyless and did not interest her at all. I did not care as I had no intention of becoming a painter anyway. But what bothered me was her wish that I become a doctor. When I was in junior high school, I started to be strongly influenced by General Nogi. At that time, a small pamphlet called The Nogi Method was published monthly in Kyoto, and the pamphlets advocated doing everything according to the Nogi Method. Once I found an article in the monthly publication stating that General Nogi hated Buddhist priests and doctors, which prompted me to appeal to my mother. Look, mother, General Nogi himself hates Buddhist priests and doctors. With a gentle smile, my mother quietly tried to persuade me. Mitsuo, you say such things because your mind is occupied with the idea of becoming a soldier, but people need to do whatever profession is suitable for their own nature. A bashful boy like you is not fit for the life of a soldier. I know your nature better than anyone else. Your nature is so gentle, and the best suited job for you is a doctor. Besides, as I am in poor health, it will be a relief if you become a doctor. I was ready to argue back, but when she said, I am in poor health, I was totally discouraged. In fact, my mother had many chronic diseases. Roughly ten years later, when I was busy moving around on assignment as a naval ensign, she passed away from uterine cancer. About a half year before she died, my mother had her first diagnosis at the Osaka Red Cross Hospital and was told that it was too late for her cancer to be treated. It still makes me sad when I think how she must have felt while she was waiting to die and thinking that if I had followed her wishes and become a doctor, I could have taken care of her much earlier. As my mother said often, I was born a bashful boy. When I was a kid, I had a fair complexion with cheeks like apples. I had a weak and fine-boned appearance, and reflecting my mother's tastes, I was sometimes dressed in a girl's kimono with a long hairstyle, making it impossible to tell if I was a boy or a girl. Every time she found me playing under the sun, she scolded me because I would get suntanned. It is not an easy job for such a child to aspire to be an admiral. When I was five years old, my father was transferred as principal of Kanmaki Village Elementary School in Nara Prefecture. The village was laid out over six separate areas, and the school, attached to the principal's residence, was located in the middle of mountains. The surrounding scenery was beautiful, but there was quite a distance between sectors of the village, three miles to the seike shop and five miles to the tofu shop. The people in the village called me by the nickname the school prince, but I was too shy to exchange greetings. My father used to enjoy sake at night, but it took me a lot of guts to go to the sake shop and carry the sake bottle back to my house. This shyness stayed with me when I entered junior high school. The moment teachers called on me to respond, blood rushed up to my head and I turned bright red like a boiled octopus. Because of this, I finally got a new nickname, Octopus. When we approached the end of the third year of junior high, the school checked each student's career aspirations to prepare for our next stage of education. The objective was to identify those students who wanted to go on to higher education and those who were going to leave school to take jobs. There would be a different curriculum for the two groups in the fourth year. I belonged to the former group, and I put Naval Academy with the hope of becoming an admiral in the future. I did not want my classmates to know about this, so I folded the paper quietly and presented it to the teacher. However, my teacher mercilessly disclosed each student's aspirations, and this caused an uproar. As soon as the teacher read, Fuchida Mitsuo Naval Academy, the entire bunch of brats in the classroom burst into a fit of laughter. See what we've just heard? Octopus wants to be a naval officer. Of all things, can you imagine Octopus in the Navy? They made a huge racket. Again, I became a boiled octopus. It seemed that none of them could believe that I was going to be a military man. In the summer, when I was in the fourth year of middle school, I joined a swimming club and went to a training camp at Futamigora Beach in Isa. We were going to learn the classic long-distance swimming method, the so-called Kankai School of Swimming, under the guidance of a master instructor. We used a six-foot-long loincloth for the swimming lessons, 
and we were told to write our name on it. When I was ready to write my name on it, a brat nearby said he would do it on my behalf. It was too late to stop him when I found he wrote Tarko, meaning octopus. I was ashamed to use the loincloth, but I did not have another one, so I went out to the beach wearing it. Everybody grinned at the sight, which made me blush instantly. The master instructor appeared and, during our lesson, corrected our swimming one by one. When he called out, Kota-san, I ignored him at first, but the moment I realised that he read Tarko from right to left, I became a boiled octopus all over again. It gave so much pleasure to the brats, who always seemed to be looking for a new way to tease me. They started to call me Kota-san, and by accident I was released from the nickname Octopus. As a side note, Two students from the Naval Academy who were graduates of our swimming school were also attending the training camp. They wore a seven-buttoned jacket with a dagger and appeared so dashing and imposing. I swore then that that is how I would look next year. This resulted in remarkable progress in my swimming. At the end of the two-week training, I passed the 14-kilometre marathon swim and was complimented when I received my diploma for my outstanding progress. All this fueled my passion for the sea. Next year, as soon as I graduated from Unebi Junior High School, I took the entrance exam for the Naval Academy. The competition was incredibly tough. One out of 14 was accepted. I barely passed the exam, and I was enrolled at the Naval Academy in Etajima on August 26, 1921. I was then 18 years old. Soon after I joined the Naval Academy, what I always heard was, Your enemy is the United States. At that time, the Japanese Navy set the United States as presumptive enemy number one. Although a presumptive enemy is identical to an imaginary enemy, the entire armament of the Japanese Navy was developed with the US Navy in mind. In the midst of the intensive shipbuilding competition that was going on, the Japanese Navy was carrying out its aggressive 8-8 fleet building project, the 8-8 fleet was an attempt to prepare a well-balanced armada centred around a group of capital ships, consisting of eight battleships and eight battlecruisers protected by auxiliary forces comprised of a significant number of cruisers, destroyers and submarines. It also required an abundant supply of naval officers, and the enrolment at the Navy Academy grew to 300 students for three consecutive classes, the 50th, 51st and the 52nd class. I was in the 52nd class, and the class was honoured with the presence of Prince Takamatsu as the class head. I remember having our photograph taken at the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Naval Academy's opening, all 900 students lined up on the parade grounds. The imaginary enemy is set in order to decide on the appropriate magnitude of our armaments requirements. The public cannot support increased taxes solely on the basis of an explanation that bigger is better. As Sun Tzu, the ancient Chinese master of the art of war, put it, a military organisation should be prepared not to fight. Soldiers are murderous weapons, and the best strategy is not to fight. This is the first lesson of military strategy. However, the generally held notion is that military power exists solely to fight, and the very existence of military power itself often provokes war. On the contrary, the essence of military power is to prevent war, in other words, the primary objective of the strategy of not fighting cannot be attained without having adequate military power to fight. This is another essential principle which may be hard for ordinary people to understand. The world today has proven that an army incapable of fighting like a scarecrow can actually lead to war. Under this motivation, the Japanese Navy set up the US Navy as the imaginary enemy number one, for the convenience of determining the appropriate magnitude of its armaments requirements. However, once such an imaginary enemy is set, it tends to lead to a real, not an imaginary, hostility. Moreover, the Naval Academy's cadets were full of vigour and arrogance. Disciplinary guidance dispensed by senior students to junior students often involved encouraging hostile sentiments against Yankees or white men, with the belief that patriotism could be built on this kind of hostility. As far as I was concerned, I thought that a soldier was someone who put on medals and carried a sword, and it was my dream from my childhood. Rather than feeling hostility against the United States, 
My stronger motivation was my determination to see my old classmates again, who disgraced me by nicknaming me Octopus. I would be in my smart and crisp uniform and would be wearing a military dagger. Each day, four months of them, was so long until the winter vacation in December. When the long-awaited winter vacation was approaching, there was a disquieting rumour that had spread throughout the academy. At that time, the Big Three, the US, the UK and Japan, were holding a disarmament conference in the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C. This Washington Naval Conference ended in an agreement that we called the Washington Naval Treaty. Japan was allotted an inferior ratio of 553, meaning that we could have only three battleships to the US and UK's five each. The Japanese government was forced to swallow this. The Americans and British also said that the Japanese Navy would have to abandon their 8-8 eight, eight fleet plan. The rumour that followed was that most of the 52nd class was to be dismissed because such a large number of cadets would no longer be required. I thought, good grief. Just when I had started my career at the Naval Academy, on my way to becoming a full admiral, I was discouraged by this negative development. Then, as I returned home for the winter vacation, contrary to my expectation of showing up and showing off in my smart uniform and dagger, I spent most of the time feeling bitter, thanks to the winds of disarmament. When I returned to the academy, I learned that enrolment reductions in the 52nd class were narrowly avoided, because school officials made the critical decision to reduce recruitment for next year's 53rd class to a mere 50 cadets. One day, when I was in my third year at Etajima, two F-5 seaplanes visited Atauchi Bay. It was still rare to see planes in those days, and students were instructed to observe the planes' operations as they landed and took off from the water. Before the start of the operation, the commander of the air squadron, Sub-Lieutenant Miyazaki, explained the performance profile of the seaplane and said that he would allow those who aspired to be aviation officers to ride in the plane. The limit was six cadets. Yes, sir? I was the first to raise my hand. At that time, I had no particular desire to be an aviator in the future, but I raised my hand anyway. In an effort to conquer my shyness, I made it my second habit to raise my hand before the others whenever the teacher asked a question, whether I had the answer or not. I thought that I could always think up the answer afterwards. Consequently, I was flying in a plane for the first time in my life. Based on that experience, I was instantly addicted to planes, and I decided to be a flyer from that day. As I am monomaniacal, once I am immersed in something, no other things interest me. I no longer wanted to be a sailor. That notion appeared ridiculous once I decided on my career as a flyer. Nevertheless, the Naval Academy is where sailors are trained. It is not the Air Force Academy and the Navy would not put me in a plane automatically after graduation. After graduation, what awaited us was the mandatory long-distance cruise designed for the practical training of sailors. Following my graduation from the Academy, on July 24, 1924, I was assigned to the training ship, the Yakumo, as a cadet ensign. I was 21 years old. Our training fleet was organised with old-fashioned cruisers, Yakumo, Asama and Izumo, each one of which had belonged to the Kamimura fleet and had a brilliant battle record in the Russo-Japan War. The commander of our training fleet was Vice Admiral Saburo Hyakutake. The fleet crossed the Pacific Ocean and arrived at San Francisco on January 23, 1925, stopping on the way at Hawaii, Panama and Acapulco. Upon my return from the long-distance cruise, I was promoted to naval ensign as of December 1st, 1925, and I became a crew member of the man of war, Yahagi. Yahagi was to be moored in Itauchi and used as the Naval Academy's training ship that year. I thought that could mean trouble for me. As I anticipated, the vice commander was a martinet, fully devoted to discipline based on the belief that lower-ranking officers on board should set a good example for the Naval Academy's students. The vice commander used to call his notion of proper behaviour seamanship with his bad English pronunciation, and he gave lectures at every opportunity. I was motivated to become a flyer, and I had absolutely no interest in the time-honoured seamanship of the windjammer days. It was natural that I became a constant target of his scolding. 
Autumn was the season to submit our annual evaluation sheets. All the officers were gathered in the officers' room, and the vice commander ordered us to submit our personal statements, and I turned mine in, stating, Strongly desire to be an aviation student. Several days later, a sailor in charge of the officers' room came to me. Navigation officer, the vice commander wants to see you. Here we go again, I thought, as nothing good ever comes from complaining. I was not eager to report. The vice commander got right to the point. You say that you want to be an aviation student. Undoubtedly you should have gotten your parents' consent. Have you done so? I was dumbstruck. As a matter of fact, far from obtaining his consent, when I returned from my long cruise, father told me emphatically that, now that you are going to be a naval officer, I am relieved, but I am telling you not to volunteer in the future for anything having to do with planes or submarines. My father had the impression that planes and submarines were risky. Many cases of accidents involving plane crashes as well as submarine deaths had been reported. He meant to say that rather than volunteer for such dangerous activities, I should stay in the main branch of the Navy, on board fighting ships. It was not that I had a clear insight at that time that the main element of sea power would shift to planes. I simply wanted to be a flyer no matter what. My father's efforts to dissuade me were not enough to crack my will. I was optimistic that my father would concede in the end, if I became a pilot first and after it was an accomplished fact. As the vice commander was talking to me, I got rattled as it seemed that he required written approval from my parents. So I responded, Well, as a matter of fact, I have not talked to my parents yet, but when I return home during the winter vacation, I intend to obtain their approval. Blushing, I stammered as I tried to explain. The vice commander nodded and said, Planes are dangerous, as you can see. Talk seriously with your parents before you decide. Besides, as you are quite capable, you don't have to force yourself to move into flying. I was repelled by his strange remark. It appeared that the vice commander believed that those who choose aviation were failed third-class officers, who, despite knowing all the risks involved, still dared to take the risk of never returning some day. In a way, that might have been true in those days. As the time for assignment rotation approached, everyone was busy whispering. Rumours were rampant that senior officers had already received tips on what their next assignment would be. Then one day, a sailor in charge of the commander's room came for me. Navigation officer, the commander is summoning you. Summons from the vice commander were frequent, but it was rare to be called by the commander himself. I reported to the commander's room after getting properly dressed. Navigation officer, I understand that you hope to become an aviation officer. Good. We are entering the age of aviation. We need talented people to move into aviation. I was confused by his encouragement. Our commander was a gunnery specialist, and he had never shown any sign during the past year that he had any understanding of or interest in aviation. His comment about aviation was an incredible transformation. I was totally perplexed. Then he said, By the way, navigation officer, from today I myself want to learn about aviation. For my immediate use, why don't you collect all the books on aviation that are available on the ship and bring them to me? Now I understood what he wanted. Control of the military education library on the ship was part of my responsibility as navigation officer, and I gathered roughly ten books related to the subject and delivered them to the commander. He wanted me to leave them all. Finally, the official announcement of new assignments was made. My assignment was a student at the Navy Gunnery School. I was happy as it was a mandatory course for junior officers, and the sooner the better to take this course. I was anxious to hear about our captain's situation, and I learned he was assigned as the commander of the Hosho. Although it was small, the Hosho was an aircraft carrier. Now I see, I chuckled to myself. Our commander made a 180-degree turn to aviation as soon as he learned that he was to be the commander of an aircraft carrier. Incidentally, our commander, about to enter the new, unknown world of aviation, did not tell me to return the books to the library until the final moment of his departure from the ship. Since he was a well-organised person, it could not be that he had forgotten. As the officer responsible for the books, 
I cautiously approached the commander and found that he, already in ceremonial uniform, was absorbed in reading the books. I smiled as it reminded me of a test taker who reads his notes until he enters the examination room. Soon after, I left the ship myself to be enrolled in a four-month course at the Naval Gunnery School in Yokosuka, where I would learn about guns, which are the Navy's main weapon. After completing gunnery school, they put me in the Naval Torpedo School for another four-month course to learn about the Navy's support weapon. Enduring many hardships, I completed both courses, which meant that I was now a qualified junior officer. Waiting for me was a welcomed appointment letter to the destroyer, Akikaze. I also received a message from the Akikaze to board the ship urgently at Saiki Bay in Oita Prefecture for a special assignment. On the way from Yokosuka to Saiki Bay, I got off at Osaka to see my bedridden mother, in spite of the urgent nature of my trip on the Akikaze. She was close to the end of her life, suffering from uterine cancer. My mother was delighted to see me, and she spoke gently to me. I am happy that you are back. This is our last farewell in this life. Look at your mother well. After my death, I want you to take care of father. As you are a military officer, you must be ready to die any moment, but your father is worried about you, especially because you want to be a flyer. Since he is becoming old, I want you to set him free from any worries, as much as possible. Your mother will always be watching over you from a different world to protect you. As I had to hurry to return to my ship, I could not stay any longer and left home, leaving my heart behind. The special assignment of the destroyer Akikaze was to escort His Majesty, the Emperor, on his tour to the Southwest Islands. I was on duty on the Akikaze's bridge, and I was watching the Imperial ship, Hiei. I remembered my mother's words. When she wanted me to give up the idea of becoming a soldier and become a doctor instead, I insisted on becoming a soldier. When she said then that I should quit the Navy and join the Army instead, I insisted on going to the Navy. And now I am insisting on becoming a flyer when she wanted me to abandon the idea. I must have a perverse spirit. I remember thinking, Ahead of the Akikaze, the Imperial flag is wind-whipped at the top of the Imperial ship's mast. I am an officer of the Imperial Navy and as such I stake my life or death for the sake of aviation, whether it is risky or not. I dedicate all the passion of my youth to the belief that the future of military might depends on aviation. For a greater cause, I accept the death of my parents as well. The Imperial ship completed the royal tours of His Majesty, the Emperor, to Okinawa Island, Miyako Island and Ishigaki Island. She was gathering speed to return to Yokosuka. I was on duty on the midnight watch on the Akikaze's bridge. The bell rang, indicating that it was 1 a.m. The date was August 10th, 1927, and we were just off the Cape at Shiono Misaki. Suddenly I saw my mother's face in my mind. I thought, I am now passing the closest point to where my mother is. As I thought about my mother, a strong flash of the Shiono Misaki lighthouse pierced through the darkness and disappeared. In the afternoon the following day, our ship arrived at Yokosuka, and there was a telegram waiting for me. Mother died at 1 a.m. Yes, right at that moment when she was passing away, her spirit actually came to where I was. Mother really protects me. Forced down in the Taiwan Strait, it was April 1930. I was 27 years old and a sub-lieutenant on board the aircraft carrier, Karga. I was part of the reconnaissance squadron. The Karga, part of the combined fleet, was the flagship of the 1st Air Squadron and carried Rear Admiral Yurikazu Edahara's commander's flag. The combined fleet was engaged in a field exercise, and we passed through Tsingtao, Dalian and Incheon. We were heading for Magong. It was a strenuous exercise, day and night, and the fleet was going to arrive at Magong the next day. Before we entered the port, there was going to be another joint drill with Magong's port department. Therefore, after we completed the previous night's drill, I sacked out on the sofa in the crew's ready room, and I still had my flying suit on. Lieutenant Masataka Nagaishi, divisional officer of the reconnaissance squadron, entered the ready room and said, Good morning. This divisional officer was hard-working, 
and he always woke up with the maintenance crew to monitor flight preparations. Good morning, how is the weather? I asked, waking up. The uneasy reply from Nagaishi was, The clouds are hanging low, and it's foggy. It's not easy today. Then Lieutenant Sujiro Wada entered. He was a skilled pilot, one class senior to me, who flew in pair with Nagaishi. He asked me, Sub-Lieutenant Fuchida, have you sent somebody to wake up Katsuhata? That guy is late again. Lieutenant Kiyoshi Katsuhata was my pair and number two unit leader of the reconnaissance squadron. He was in the same class at the academy as Wada, but was two years behind him as an aviation student. More important, his skills were deficient, and his sense as a pilot was far from commendable. I called the duty sailor. Go wake up Lieutenant Katsuhata. He's in his room. Yes, sir. I will go and wake up Lieutenant Katsuhata, the sailor said as he left. Then the squadron leader, Lieutenant Commander Munetaka Sakamaki, entered. Look, they've changed our squadron's duty this morning. We've been ordered to cease drill activity to find a dead body. He showed us the telegraphic order from the combined fleet. The fact was that, after termination of the exercise the previous night, the captain of one of the submarines was missing. Lieutenant Commander Yoshiroku Yoshimura had stepped down to his private room for a rest after the drill. He left the operation of the submarine to the officer on deck. It was past 10pm when Yoshimura stepped down. At 3am the following day, the sailor in charge of delivering telegraphed communications knocked on the captain's door, but there was no response. He could not find him on the bridge, deck or in the restroom, every conceivable place where the commander might be. After searching all these areas with no results, the sailor reported to the officer on deck on the bridge. Officer on deck, I can't find the captain anywhere. The officer shouted, Don't be silly! This was followed by an uproar. Shouts over the loudspeaker called for the captain again and again, without any response. If he was not found anywhere in the ship, the only possible assumption was that he fell into the water. Along with the other submarines in the group, the missing captain's submarine turned back to trace the route it had run from 10pm until 3am in an attempt to find the missing captain. The order from the combined fleet was to cooperate in the search, and that included the Kaga's reconnaissance squadron. Finally, Lieutenant Katsuhata appeared. Rubbing his sleepy eyes, he muttered, Searching for a dead body under such bad weather conditions can result in another dead body. What he said was an omen of things to come. Four reconnaissance planes took off from the Kaga at 5.30 that morning. The cloud ceiling was 500 metres, with sporadic fog gathering. Visibility was poor. Having reached our searching point in Wild Goose Formation, the four planes started widening the distance of our search area. We took a course bearing 32 degrees to fly over the trail of the submarine on our return. The flight altitude was 30 metres, and I was trying with all my effort to spot the dead body from the lower observation window, flat on my belly on the floor of the reconnaissance platform. Typically, one tour is considered completed after 60 nautical miles, and then the plane turns around. We repeated four turns, but failed to find the body. Then we decided to return according to our flight plan, pointing the compass needle to the cargo. However, the ship did not come into sight when we reached the estimated time of contact. We searched all around, but we could not find her. The plane we were flying in was a Type 13 carrier torpedo bomber, a biplane officially adopted in 1923, and its cruise duration was three hours. We had already been flying for over two and a half hours. If we failed to find the mothership within 30 minutes, we would have no other choice but to make a forced landing on the sea. We were in a carrier plane with wheels, so that meant that we would sink instantly. I felt my sight was dimming when I thought that my 27-year life might be coming to an end. I talked to Katsuhata, who was steering the plane, through the voice pipe. Sorry, Lieutenant. I lost our plane's position because of a mistake in the navigation method. We will return using radio navigation. OK, Katsuhata responded, sounding helpless. I told the radio operator in the back seat to inform the mothership that we required bearing information. The operator clicked the telegraph key several times, 
and this was followed by the prolonged sounds of long electric waves. Then there was a quick reply, bearing 47 degrees. I was relieved. This meant that we still had further to fly before we contacted the mothership, but we now had a course bearing. Lieutenant, the mothership replied bearing 47 degrees. We will return to the ship taking the course bearing 127 degrees. Katsuhata seemed to be relieved. We kept flying with the needle fixed at 127 degrees, but the mothership still refused to come into sight. At that time, determining radio direction was still primitive. If it was a long wave, the bearing line could be determined, but it was hard to tell which direction the radio signal was coming from, and it was up to the chief radio officer's judgment. That day, since our operational ocean surface was to the north of the mothership, they advised us that the bearing was 127 degrees. In reality, it was the opposite direction. Because of a navigational error, we lost the plane's positioning, and we were actually in the direction 127 degrees from the mothership. Therefore, if we continued to fly in that direction, we would be moving farther away from the mothership. Fuchida, we only have enough fuel for another ten minutes, Katsuhata reported with an uneasy voice. I thought it was all over for us. The cloud height was 500 metres, and the plane was flying just below the clouds. As far as we could see, the ocean surface was stormy, and we could see nothing but the white caps of the waves. I was prepared that my final moment had come. Then, suddenly, I seemed to hear somebody whispering to me, Increase the altitude, increase the altitude. But increasing the altitude would do no good. Above 500 metres, there was nothing but endless, thick clouds. However, the whispering, increase the altitude, refused to go away. We had absolutely no other solution, so I decided to follow the voice. Lieutenant Katsuhata, we will start increasing our altitude. Katsuhata was surprised and reluctant to follow. Increase our altitude and thick clouds. I was not in a position to give him an order as he was senior to me, and he was the commander of the plane. However, as the navigator, I could give him instructions regarding navigational methods. I used every tactic I knew of, and finally persuaded him by saying that we had exhausted all other options, and that the only possibility of survival was to increase our altitude. Finally, he gave in. As soon as the plane started to increase its altitude, we entered into the cloud and were flying blind. We could see absolutely nothing. In order to make sure that this dull pilot did not make an error in his steering, I leaned forward from the reconnaissance seat, held his shoulder with both of my hands, watched the meter indicators, and had him increase our altitude slowly. The fuel meter indicated zero, but I thought we could continue to fly for a while. We continued this uneasy flight for close to 20 minutes before we finally moved out of the cloud. The altimeter showed 2,700 metres. Above the cloud, it was very clear and sunny. Just then, our engine let out a sound like, Broom! Broom! And the propellers stopped. The fuel was completely gone. The plane could no longer fly. Now, we had no other choice but to glide. At that moment, I caught a glimpse of a white spot between the clouds. As I stared at it with the binoculars, I saw that it was a white sailing ship. I estimated the distance to be approximately 10,000 metres ahead of our position. I shouted through the voice pipe, Lieutenant Katsuhata, I want you to glide targeting the sailing ship ahead. The distance is 10,000 metres. Please glide steadily without reducing our altitude too much. In general, a plane may glide four times the distance of its altitude. Since we were now at an altitude of 2,700 metres, we were perfectly set to glide 10,000 metres. I grinned. How lucky we are! In no time, the plane landed on the water just by the sailing ship's leeward side. At the moment of impact, the legs of our plane were caught by the water and we flipped upside down. My face hit the windshield of the reconnaissance seat, injuring my right cheek. The scar I have is a permanent reminder of that injury. The sailing ship hauled in its sails and lowered a rescue boat to save us. It was a trading junk heading for Shantong, loaded with molasses from Kaohsiung. I was eager to know our location and asked the captain, who could not speak Japanese, by writing my question in Chinese characters. 
We were just halfway between Kaohsiung and Shantung. I checked the location on my air map, but I had absolutely no idea how we ended up in such a remote location. In Shantong, the captain kindly delivered us to the Japanese consulate general in the city. The consul general, Mr. Kumakichi Beppu, gave some reward money to our rescuers and cordially entertained us. A telegraph was sent out immediately, and the destroyer Akikaze, attached to the first air squadron, was sent to pick us up. I felt nostalgic as I was once stationed on board the Akizake. We finally got back to our mothership, Kaga, which was moored in Keelung Harbour. I had sent a telegraph message to the Kaga before our emergency landing in the Strait of Taiwan. We are making emergency landing, running out of fuel. Position of plane is unknown, but there is sailing ship nearby. We expect to be saved by the ship. 0900. While the wreckage of our plane was discovered after an all-out search effort by the combined fleet, the Kaga did not know anything about our whereabouts for almost a week until they received the telegram from the Consul General in Shanton. Our shipmates were relieved to see us back from the dead, and they burst out with joy and welcomed us when we finally made it back to the ship. Incidentally, a review of our flight prior to our emergency landing found that, during the third passage of our search mission, I instructed the pilot, Lieutenant Katsuhata, to take a bearing of 32 degrees. Katsuhata fixed the needle to 32 degrees and recited, Bearing 32 degrees, OK? Following his confirmation, I normally should have checked if the needle was actually set at 32 degrees by looking at the compass in the reconnaissance seat, but I was too eager to search for the dead body from the lower window. I was flat on my belly on the floor, and I neglected to stand up and check the compass needle. This was the cause of the error. As it turns out, Katsuhata, who believed that he set the plane's bearing at 32 degrees, was actually flying towards 320 degrees. The reason was that the air compass of those days had four needles in the centre. The needles were marked 0, 1, 2 and 3, and the anterior edge was scaled from 0 to 90. If you wanted to fly towards 32 degrees, you had to simply adjust the zero needle to the scale 32 on the anterior edge. For whatever reason, Katsuhata set the three needle to the scale 20 on the edge, resulting in a course direction of 320 degrees. I decided our return bearing after the fourth turn without knowing that we had been flying off course, and because of this directional error, we could never have made it back to the mothership. Besides, radio direction error was added, resulting in our emergency landing in an inconceivable location. There is no question that the pilot was inept for having misread the compass, but my responsibility as the navigator was to check the setting, and my failure to do so cannot be excused. In spite of this, everybody praised my action to increase our altitude when we had only enough fuel to last another ten minutes. Above all, when I reported to Admiral Isuke Yamamoto, commander of the combined fleet, I was praised enormously that my guiding action was the most appropriate under the circumstances. I explained that at first I had no conviction about what to do, and I just followed the voice of somebody whispering in my mind. Whose voice do you think it was? the Admiral asked. I answered, I really don't know, but it might have been my deceased mother. Yamamoto was silent for a moment and nodded. It probably was. However, now I have the conviction that it was the voice of Jesus, who ushered me to safety long before I recognised him. In 1930, the year I was involved in the emergency landing in the Taiwan Strait, the naval disarmament talks involving the US, UK, Japan, France and Italy were taking place in London. It had been eight years since the conclusion of the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922. At that time, the three participating nations, the US, UK and Japan, had agreed to the ratio of capital ships of 553, and now they were going to place limits on auxiliary ships. The London Naval Treaty was soon ratified. They say five nations were involved, but there was a big gap between the naval power of the two smaller nations, France and Italy, and the three larger nations, the US, UK and Japan. It should not have been a major concern for France and Italy, 
But the problem for Japan was that the Japanese Navy was constrained again with an inferior ratio of 60% against the US and UK in the force size of auxiliary ships. The treaty caused a huge uproar inside the Japanese Navy, which had determined that it had no chance of winning a war against its imaginary enemy number one, the US Navy in the Western Pacific Ocean, unless the ratio against the US was kept at 70%. A treaty with a 60% ratio was simply out of the question. On the pretext that it constituted an intervention in the Supreme Command's jurisdiction, Admiral Kanji Kato, Secretary General of the Naval Military Command Department, resigned in protest against Prime Minister Osachi Hamaguchi's government. The uproar went to a further extreme when Lieutenant Commander Eiji Kusakari of the Military Command Department waited at the station for the arrival of the Naval Minister Takeshi Takarabe, a member of the conference mission, to hand him a dagger. He meant to tell the minister that he should commit harakiri. I was watching the uproar from the aircraft carrier Kaga. Frankly, what I did not quite understand was why they were fussing about the force size, whether it was 70% or 60%. The centre of the commotion was that the request for a ratio of 70% was rejected. This covered the 10 000 ton cruisers, which mounted 8-inch guns and were considered to be the main element of the auxiliary force. Under the terms of the treaty, aircraft carriers were still included in the auxiliary force. Therefore, I personally thought that, as a compromise, it was a good idea to halt all construction of the worthless 10 000 ton cruisers and instead deploy all our resources to the building of aircraft carriers. However, from my position as a mere sub-lieutenant, I could not stick my nose into such a subject. Against this background, the Washington Naval Treaty was set to expire in 1936. If any of the participating nations gave two years prior notice, the treaty could be abolished at the end of 1936. In this context, Japan proposed abolishment in 1934 on the pretext that the nation could no longer endure the unfair treaty. On the other hand, the London Naval Treaty had a term of five years with an expiration date set in 1935. However, it was agreed to hold another conference the year before expiration so that the participating nations could discuss post-London Naval Treaty disarmament issues. Under the circumstances, in 1934, the UK proposed to open preliminary disarmament talks in London, and representatives from five nations, the US, UK, Japan, France and Italy, met again to discuss disarmament issues. The chief representative for the Japanese was Rear Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. In these preliminary talks, the Japanese Navy proposed a new treaty based on the principle of gross tonnage. Japan's objective was to abolish the Washington Treaty and London Treaty because of their unfairness, so they agreed with the disarmament itself. And in this proposal, the Japanese Navy insisted on the total elimination of aircraft carriers. On this matter, I was frightened to death. I thought it was sheer madness. What this implied was that armament is not for invasion of other nations, but only for the protection of one's own country. We were proposing to abolish all weapons of offence, limiting us to only defensive weapons based on the principle of no threat slash no invasion. And, according to this premise, we were proposing to abolish all aircraft carriers and even battleships if necessary. I thought what a foolish navy to make such a naive statement. This was nothing but a defensive weapons only security theory, a childish trick. It is an ironclad rule articulated by Sun Tzu the Chinese strategist genius, that the most important objective of any military power is not to fight. On the other hand, it is also an ironclad rule that, unless a military power is good enough to fight and win, that military power is incapable of accomplishing the first objective of military power, which is to avoid fighting. There can be no difference between offensive and defensive. Offence and defence are two sides of the same coin, this has been an unchangeable rule for thousands of years. Since ancient times, there has been no victory won exclusively by defence. I did. Not care if they abolished battleships, which had become antiquated. But the idea of abolishing aircraft carriers was sheer madness. At that time, 
I already had a strong premonition that the main force of the Navy would move to aircraft carriers, in view of the trend of rapid progress in aviation power across the globe. In those days, however, it seemed that there was no one among the top leaders of the Japanese Navy who understood that aircraft carriers would be the main force behind maintaining our premier position as a sea power. Meanwhile, preliminary talks in London ended up in failure, and the main conference in London the following year also broke down. Thus, the world entered a no-treaty era once again, 13 years after the disarmament conference in Washington. This plunged the developed world into a shipbuilding competition. Ostentatiously, the US announced a huge shipbuilding plan. Since it was impossible for Japan to compete in terms of volume, after a great deal of deliberation, the Navy decided to focus on quality. The Japanese Navy had already anticipated the advent of the No Treaty Age, as early as the commencement of the preliminary talks in London. The Naval General Staff ordered the Technical Department to commence a study of mammoth battleships, which far exceeded anything in existence at the time. The outcome of this study was a construction plan for four extraordinary super battleships, with a displacement of 72,000 tonnes each, mounting nine 18-inch main guns. The construction would mobilise Japan's unique and very sophisticated shipbuilding technology. For the sake of confidentiality, the project was codenamed Maru-3 Plan. As early as July 1936, it was decided to construct two ships initially, the Yamato and the Musashi, and under top secrecy, their construction began at the Kure Naval Shipyard and the Mitsubishi Nagasaki Shipyard. It was after my enrolment in the Naval Staff College as a Category Co student, lieutenants or lieutenant commanders who reached 10 years of service after graduating from the Naval Academy were eligible. On December 1, 1936, that I heard about the existence of this Maru 3 plan. There were 24 Category Co students in our 36th class, and seven were involved in aviation. The curriculum for Category Co students was two years long, and the 35th class ahead of us also had seven students focused on aviation. These 14 students were encouraged to enlighten others with one voice, pointing out the uselessness of the super battleships and trying to persuade the higher-ups to change the Maru 3 plan away from battleships to aircraft carriers. However, the majority inside the Navy remained unaware of the fast progress of aviation military power, still believing strongly in the big ship, big gun theory of sea power since the battle in the Sea of Japan. To them, what we called the versatility theory of aviation was just a set of meaningless words. In view of this situation, we held what we called aviation study workshops at Tokyo Suikosha, the Naval Officers Club, every Sunday. We asked Captain Takijiro Onishi, who was the training director of the aviation headquarters at that time, to take a leading role. Participants included aviation-related parties from the Ministry of the Navy, General Staff, Aviation Headquarters, Naval Staff College, Yokosuka Air Squadron and Yokosuka Naval Air Technical Arsenal. Studies covered specialties of strategy, operations, techniques, technologies and other subjects. We also made announcements to invite officers from non-aviation departments. In this study workshop, there was an active exchange of opinions among young aviation experts, and my impression was that the Navy had never before seen such a productive workshop. Many of the enthusiastic opinions suggested foresight as well as insight, in light of how rapidly everything was changing. Nevertheless, the naval authorities ordered us to wind down as a private study workshop. The reason they gave us was that it was a discussion of a private nature. As a result, this workshop was dissolved after only three meetings, which was a shame and a loss. Looking back, we should have been more tactful in enlightening our colleagues. Instead, we were critical and cocky. There are three idiotic items in the world, the battleship Yamato, the Great Wall of China and the pyramids, which annoyed to no end the top leaders of the Navy, who saw the construction of the Yamato and Musashi as the Navy's salvation. However, I was discontented. If they did not like our private meetings, why didn't they pick it up as an official workshop? This aviation study workshop was the very lifeline of enlightenment the Japanese Navy needed in those days. 
How dare they call it private discussions? Here was potentially the biggest reason Japan lost the Pacific War many years later. Instead of listening to what we had to say, the traditionalists were pursuing a dream of sea power that was based on the antiquated historical treatise of Big Ship, Big Gun. Upon graduating from the Naval Staff College, I was assigned as the aviation leader of the Reujo, a medium-sized aircraft carrier. I joined the special Guangdong attack operation. In the dive bombing team under my command, experienced and superior pilots like Lieutenant Takashige Egusa and Lieutenant Mamoru Seki gave me the confidence to run around the battlefield leading the warhorses. However, the Guangdong attack operation was easily and successfully completed before I had a chance to flex my muscles as a leader. Back then, probably because of excessive drinking with these guys, I vomited up blood and experienced major stomach problems. The chief doctor examined me and said I had a gastric ulcer. Doctor, I just vomited up some tomatoes I ate a while back. To my bluster, he said, I am not a horse doctor who would confuse tomatoes and the vomiting of blood. I gave in, and ever since I have suffered a lot being restricted in both drinking and smoking. This incident seemed to have reached the personnel department, and I was assigned as staff to the Sasebo Naval District the following year. It was an easy job which doubled as recreation. In the meantime, my physical condition was restored, and I was assigned as the Group Aviation Commander of the Akagi. It was November 1st, 1939, and I could not have been happier. For a man who advocated the supremacy of aircraft carriers in naval operations, I was given a choice assignment. That year, the Akagi belonged to the 1st Aviation Fleet. Since her consort, the Kaga, was away from the fleet for renovations, the Akagi was the only aircraft carrier in the 1st Aviation Fleet. Our commander was Rear Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa, and the commander of the ship was Captain Ryunosuke Kusaka. Commander of the combined fleet at the time was Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto understood aviation quite well, but he still appeared to me to be too soft in his awareness that the central force of the battle fleet was shifting to aircraft carriers and that battleships had become mere backup forces. At that time, the combined fleet was engaged in intensive training day in and day out based on the revised battle guidelines, in anticipation of the addition of the Yamato and the Musashi, and the staff who were involved in the battle revisions were self-satisfied. Their assumption was that, when the enemy masts come in sight above the horizon, the distance is 48,000 metres. We will then order deployment and commence firing at a distance of 45,000 metres, at all times maintaining a distance out of the enemy's range. They expected a repetition of the dream of the Battle of Tsushima, where Japan defeated Russia. It irritated me just to hear their senseless talk. Whether the shooting range was 45,000 or 50,000 metres, it was not out of range. They did not seem to be aware that the shooting range of an air attack was 300 nautical miles. I admit that in those days, it was accepted wisdom in the Navy that aircraft carriers were categorised as auxiliary forces. In principle, therefore, aircraft carriers were dispersed and deployed individually, and their main duty was search and reconnaissance. They might be called on to engage in an air attack, but the expectation was limited to include mainly cooperation with the submarine fleet to harass the enemy fleet. This was also the case whenever we had map exercises at the Naval Staff College. Under the prevailing common thinking, even if the aviation leader held the rank of Naval Lieutenant Commander, his repeated explanations that the aircraft carrier was the main element of the fleet sounded like an overblown theory of aviation's versatility. I was determined to prove the attack capabilities of aircraft carriers, by all means, as the first step in enlightening the rest of the Navy, and I led the Akagi Aviation Squadron with determination. Ozawa's original specialty was torpedoes, and it appeared that aviation was new to him. But what he emphasised from his arrival was the importance of concentrated air attacks launched from aircraft carriers as well as unified command. I was encouraged by what the commander had to say. Fuchida, carrier-based air power, is the key factor in sea battles. He also added, this power should be employed en masse.
Since this is what I had consistently argued, I was immensely overjoyed. Consequently, I had great esteem for this commander, one who had such a superb understanding of aviation's role. In those days, Japanese naval aviation was characterised by elitism. There is nothing wrong with elitism, but the point was that they seemed to have forgotten that the essence of air power lies in mass deployment. In this respect, I valued Commander Ozawa very highly. Although he was an amateur in the field of aviation, he quickly saw that the key point of aviation is collective deployment. Consequently, I wanted to be under his command for the following year, fully involved in mass assault practice drills by carrier-based air power. Unfortunately, there were not enough opportunities to practice. The first aviation squadron consisted solely of the Akagi, and only Soryu remained in the second aviation squadron this year because of Hiryu's absence due to remodelling. Besides, in practice drill or training, Akagi and Soryu often assumed enemy positions against each other. Still, Ozawa was very enthusiastic about mass assault, taking every opportunity to negotiate with various air branches to establish coordination with land-based medium bombers or even with seaplanes of the homeland battle squadrons. As the group commander of the Akagi Air Squadron, I always took unified command of the combined group, but what gave me a headache each and every time was the problem of group assembly. If assembly is not done perfectly, the intended mass assault is sporadic, failing to exert its concentrated power. However, with the planes of several air squadrons coming from diverse locations, it was not an easy job to assemble at a predetermined point above the ocean at a fixed time. I got fed up as we had not succeeded even once in getting together at the assembly point at exactly the fixed time, always being obliged to wait. In view of the situation, I came up with an idea. The idea was that the problem of assembly over the ocean occurs because of the independent deployment of individual carriers. However, this can be solved by group deployment. Such a simple matter was out of consideration in those days. The conventional wisdom that prevailed was independent deployment, the objective being to make the carrier less visible and to reduce the risk of enemy attack in light of the carrier's vulnerability. However, even for this problem, group deployment of carriers can provide a bigger number of anti-air escort planes to protect the entire carrier group more effectively and with greater protection. I recommended this idea to Ozawa. Commander, if Akagi and Kaga of the 1st Air Squadron and Soryu and Hiryu of the 2nd Air Squadron are organised as a single aviation fleet, we can carry out our practice drills for massive assault as a carrier air force. Based on a concentrated deployment of the four carriers, everybody in the Navy will realise that carrier air strength can be the main player in decisive battles. Please recommend this to the authorities immediately. Ozawa nodded with a smile. I will. Thus, after practice was ended in the first half of 1940, Ozawa submitted his opinion to the Minister of the Navy regarding the organisation of the aviation fleet. Its substance was as follows. In order to exert maximum air power in a sea battle, it is required to concentrate all the striking power of our planes. In order to concentrate all our aviation striking power, an organisational structure with unified leadership of all naval flyers under a single commander is required from peacetime, enabling practice under his command at any time. If such a unified command of all aviation troops is based on a temporary military division, the resulting command will be temporary as well, ending up with a weak mental unity of the leader and subordinates and an uneven degree of proficiency, making it diff eicult to implement EF active command for a mass assault. This is evident based on the fact that we failed to achieve a satisfactory result after all our practice in the first half of this year, in spite of repeated practices, by putting each aviation troop of the 1st and 2nd Aviation Squadrons and the 1st Combined Air Troop under a single temporary leadership. Therefore, we must organise the aviation fleet immediately in the Combined Fleet by transferring all the carriers to the fleeting order to expedite practice in view of the threatening international situation. I was happy as my ideas were fully reflected in Ozawa's recommendation to the Minister of Navy.